I'm going to stay on an optimistic tone uh, and focus on just areas that you all are most excited about. It could be a subsector, it could be a business model, a technology, really any area. I, I want to give our, our audience a bit of hope in terms of uh, human innovation, the ability to address this challenge. It's obviously daunting when you look at global carbon emissions, but let's focus on the positive side. So for any of you all, where, where would you start? Lisa, where would you start? Yeah, so I mean, we're most excited when we talked about the need for dynamism and flexibility on the grid. So we're most excited about power, kit, uh, power equipment uh, manufacturers um, that can, you know, um, supply the, the equipment that's needed. Uh, you know, companies that supply equipment, um, critical infrastructure to upgrade the grids. Um, companies in the nuclear value chain, copper producers, and then companies that supply critical infrastructure to data centers. Those are kind of the areas that we're most excited That's about. Great. Greg, where would you go? Yeah, I'm really excited about a lot of the innovation we see happening around decision making um, and speed of decision making, especially in times of crisis. You know, something that we think about a lot is climate resilience, and we're going to have more and more extreme weather and fires and droughts and storms. And a lot of that stuff just happens pretty quickly, and people have to make very rapid, people or businesses, very rapid decisions on how you respond to that. You know, whether it's a, a company making a decision about their assets or their aircraft or, you know, people about their lives and do I stay and go or, you know, a utility in the middle of a storm and, you know, how do I get my grid back, back up and running quickly. And we're just seeing lots of use cases around smarter AI influencing that decision making, let people make decisions on the fly much more quickly and you know just examples of utilities being able to have a layer that can automatically analyze the calls into the call center people filling out a form on their website as it comes in to rapidly kind of triage you know is this a problem is it a down power line where is it do I need to send a crew um, even in, in advance leading up to those things you know AI modeling for the storm that everyone says is coming to Florida you know where do we think it's going to hit and use very detailed sort of digital twin modeling of my grid to say based on all the storm projections, you know, here's the parts of my power infrastructure that might get knocked out. These specific lines, these specific power lines, you know, and poles, these transformers, and let me pre-position some equipment and crews where I think that's happening so we can get up to speed more quickly. Um, so those are just a couple examples, but we see, we see a ton around just operational decision making influenced by AI that just lets people get to answers much more quickly than, than you can, you know, humans can on their own. Great point. Lovely. Yeah, I come at this from kind of a couple of different angles as I sit in both venture capital and then sort of later stage. I think on the venture capital side, long dated transformative technologies will always be very exciting. Um, I, I consistently am just interested in where kind of fusion is, is going to go. Um, and, uh, but I think that um, if nearer term, if you're thinking about kind of pre-2030, which is what we all really need to be thinking about in terms of this you know, resilience to climate events, uh, which seem to be getting worse and worse, is what can you build now that might enable um, that you know, new economy in the future? And, and to Lisa's point, power, um, power equipment, which is going to be needed in the balance of plant for any kind of form of, uh, of power generation. Um, so things like high temperature superconductors, um, which you can use both in fusion and in other applications, you can use them also to upgrade existing grid lines to take more power um, over longer distances. It's still kind of early stage technology, but I think that's something that, you know, for the same given grid, so we don't even need to build more lines, we could have more power being transmitted. That would be, you know, a material and very low hanging fruit change that we could make to um, kind of build the transmission and distribution whilst we're also building the, the generation side. That's a great point. I mean, I think we've already said a lot of these, but storage technologies, the transmission capacity build out, so interstate at versus interstate transmission lines, wind and solar. Um, another area of interest for us is e-fuels. Um, so jet fuel from biomass and uh, someone's like, you know, science fiction, renewable natural gas from methane captured from animal dairy farms. <laughs> uh, so some of these kind of good areas. I think outside of just wind and solar, it's a lot of the, the sort of um, adjacent, you know, technologies. And so we think about um, like smart solutions, um, smart meters, uh, you know, insulation, energy efficient lighting, kind of smart building, energy efficient transport. Um, all of these things, I, I mentioned green hydrogen, also e-methanol, um, ammonia, et cetera, sustainable aviation fuel. I've been asked on behalf of our equities uh, business to sort of point out that after obviously a period of a lot of volatility in, in um, 
you know, valuations, that we have a, a, a really a reset, we think, an attractive long-term risk and reward moving forward. Um, so it's like, it's not what it looked like in 2019, or, or rather it's reset back to what it looked like in 2019. So valuations are, are now no longer um, outsized um, and, and they're not discounting excessive future returns and, and expected earnings. That's kind of, again, from their side. And then on behalf of our um, a renewable uh, infrastructure business, I've been asked to point out that the good investment idea right now uh, is instead of buy, is buying operating assets versus investing in development projects. I'm going to slow down. And the reason for that is that profit margins for developers have temporarily compressed, lowering the development risk premium. And on the other hand, risk premium for operating assets is at a decade high as the supply of operating assets coming to market is increasing, uh, while the buyer pool for these assets is not increasing as much. So you have a supply-demand mismatch, which you know is in favor of folks like our green coat business. It is interesting. I mean, when we look at valuations, the classic renewable stocks are often not expensive at all. There have been much shinier objects to chase, especially in the world of AI. Nuclear has caught a bit, of course, but uh, it is a little stunning to me that renewable energy has been, uh, has been overlooked. And we looked recently at SMR nuclear technology, and we're very excited about it. But when I look at the magnitude of likely gigawatt uh, development in the United States, you know, it could be a handful of gigawatts by the mid-2030s. Very exciting. Some of our companies do more uh, than that volume every year in renewable energy and have underperformed dramatically. So it is, it's just, it's an area full of alpha opportunity, tremendous volatility, but uh, it, it is interesting to see the market chase some of the shinier objects out there. So. Yeah. I, I think especially when you layer in storage and the declining cost of batteries to that, and so all of a sudden renewables plus cheaper and cheaper and cheaper batteries is storage which gets you closer to base load, which is kind of the holy grail, the grail that nuclear solves. Um, you know, it's a, it's a race on the cost curve. And, um, you know, to your point, I think, uh, you know, the, the renewables plus the batteries probably present a pretty interesting value proposition. 